We got a big interview coming up now. Let's get to that. Uh, I've been saying since I got the advanced copy of this manuscript that this is an amazing book on an amazing, unique and individual in professional wrestling. I often read books on wrestling, but I don't often, if at all, ever learn as much about one individual as I did from reading this book because we've talked about it. The Sheik purposely led people on red herrings and hid his background and hid his personal life and created the mystique around himself. And in an amazing set of circumstances, he had a 50-year career in professional wrestling, uh, one of the top 10 box office attractions, the probably the all-time biggest box office attraction heel that ever stepped foot in a wrestling ring. There was Tremendous positives to the Sheik, tremendous negatives. Uh, finally, someone has taken on the task of writing the definitive biography of this guy who even his own friends didn't know a lot about. And that man is Brian Solomon, and of course the man is the Sheik that he wrote about, and the book is called, wait, I'm reaching my notes again. The book is called Blood and Fire. I'm reaching, I know Blood and Fire, but I'm trying to get the subtitle. Blood and Fire, the unbelievable real-life story of wrestling's original Sheik is the title of the book, and it is on sale on April 12th, but they're taking pre-orders now on Amazon. Blood and Fire by Brian Solomon, pre-orders now on Amazon, and we recorded this interview a little bit earlier today. And we're going to go to that now, Brian, if you can, and we will talk to the author of Blood and Fire, the Story of the Sheik. Well, Brian, thank you so much for being here because I've looked forward to this ever since I got the manuscript last year, whenever, uh, because this book has, has needed to be done. The most mysterious guy for a shoot in wrestling has finally, the, the curtain has been pulled back somewhat. So thank you for being here to plug this thing. Boy, thanks for bringing me on. I'm, I'm I'm really excited. This book has taken over my life for the last couple of years. So, <laughs> you know, I, I'm ready for it to come out. This is great. Well, you know, the thing is, I marveled at the research. And, you know, I research is fun and at the same time maddening because you end up uncovering so much stuff and you've got to a newspaper article from here and a magazine article from there. And it's all 60 years old and you're trying to put all this stuff together. Um, Tim Hornbaker does great research. Rock rims for his California books has done impeccable research, but you tackled a subject that is pro this, the Sheik Ed Farhat is probably little, uh, littler is known about his personal life and his early days, especially than anybody else in the business, because he tried to keep it so cloudy. So how did you tackle that research job and, and where did you start? Well, I, I think the issue of how secretive his life was is probably why nobody had tried to do a book before, or, you know, it was just, it's too difficult. And, and I think before the internet, let's say, I don't even know how I would have done it. I mean, it would have taken me a lot longer to do, especially because right when I started working on it, which was the fall of 2019, um, COVID hit like a few months <laughs> after that. So the idea of me, you know, I had all these lofty plans. I'm going to travel to Detroit and I'm going to go to the, the hall of records and blah, 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 blah. And I was stuck in my house for months, you know? So, so I had to kind of work around that, but you know, it's one of those things where you would really be surprised at what can be found if you dig around. And I think maybe people just didn't know where to look. But I mean, I was able to request his military records, okay, from the from the national whatever it is, Office of Records. I got, you know, his his birth records, his death records, just Ancestry.com is incredible what you can find on there. And because you're talking about the early family stuff, I was able to find, you know, ships manifests showing oh. when his parents came over from Syria and things like that. And, you know, there would be times where I'm looking at stuff and sitting there and thinking to myself, I think I may be the only living human being on this planet right now who is aware of this fact that I'm looking at. 
and I have to put it in this book. Yeah. And well, and I guess this would have been possible before the internet, but as an old friend of ours used to say, highly unlikely. <laughs> just uh, much because, harder, yeah. Just because you would have had to literally gone to all these different cities and these places where the, the stuff is kept and it, it nothing. I remember even 10 years ago before the newspapers.com thing got popular, uh, you know, John Cosper and I were going to the Louisville Library to do research on Louisville wrestling, just looking at the old newspaper ads. Um but you you profile his family, his his uh, his early life, and the way he got into the wrestling business, and which for the first little while he was unremarkable, and there was nothing going on. And then, you know, suddenly the when did the 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 chic come in? I'm trying to remember back to when I read the manuscript. Uh, well, that- I saw one of the real advanced copies. <laughs> That's right. That was printed out specifically for you at Staples. I went to great lengths <laughs> to get that to you. Two reams of paper they had to go through. So, you know, that was uh, – but I'm glad I did it. Oh, but um, but to your question, I mean, it, it's kind of one of these things where um, – so that was something else that I, that I uncovered that I think was not really part of the conventional knowledge about his career because the conventional wisdom always was – that he and everyone I asked told me the same thing, that he just emerged fully formed um, as the Sheik of Araby, that he never had a match where he wasn't using that uh, gimmick or persona. And that turned out to not be true. I discovered that. OK, so he starts calling himself the Sheik of Araby in 1949. And that's when people start, you know, would always say, well, that's when he started. But he was wrestling for two years before that under his real name, Ed Farhat, uh, straight out of the army with the angle being, you know, this squeaky clean uh, local Lansing boy, um, you know, served in the war and now he's back and he's a YMCA wrestler and just, you know, you know, total white meat baby face, what you would never imagine. And and I and I found on newspapers.com, glad you mentioned that. I mean, that is a godsend. I found <laughs> the article listing advertising his first match and it has a picture of him just as a wrestler, but just as himself. And apparently he did that, yeah, for a couple of years. And then I think it was partly Harry Light and partly Burt Ruby that got together with him and they and they sort of came up with the Sheik of Araby thing, which came from a popular the title of a popular song. Well, now and a lot of people now are sitting there thinking, well, how was this guy so mysterious when he had already been wrestling as himself? One of the key things, key facts to make that transition a little easier was not only that he hadn't been used in really a main event capacity and he hadn't been pushed, but also there was no television. He had, he hadn't been beamed out his, his style, his look, his visage hadn't been beamed out on television to everybody. It was only in the small clubs that he worked in live that you would have been able to see him as himself. And then suddenly Television comes around, and now with a little bit different look and the whole gimmick, he's the Sheik of Araby, and he's on TV to vast amounts more people than he had ever appeared in in front of before. Yeah, it was much easier to keep those things secret back then, obviously. And even even visually, I, I, I would even say if you had even been there in one of those small shows and seen him, you might not have even known that it was the same guy because he was completely clean shaven. You know, all he had was just plain pair of trunks, plain pair of boots. I don't think you'd even be able to make the connection, honestly. But but I don't think he had his first thinking about it now. I don't believe that he would have even been on television until he wound up going with Fred Kohler and Jim Barnett on Chicago TV, the Marigold stuff, which was already a few years into his career. So so nobody. The average wrestling fan would have had no idea who he was before, say, 1952 or 53, about. Well, yeah, and actually, uh, I said television came in, but even Detroit didn't get television wrestling uh, until the early 50s. Also, it was the network stuff, if they, you know, whatever television stations were on the air then, but they didn't have a local program at that point in time. And, And here's another fun fact. Some of my childhood interests clashing together because uh, in the old days, the promoter in Detroit was Adam Weissmuller, who was Johnny Weissmuller's brother, who was 
not only an Olympic swimmer, but Tarzan in the movies that I, you know, loved Tarzan movies before I even saw wrestling. That's right. Yeah. Adam Weissmuller was before, because at the time that the Sheik um, started, the, the main guy in Detroit was Harry Light. He was the NWA representative for Detroit, the whole thing. He was kind of the king of Detroit. And you also had um, Burt Ruby as kind of like his his second in command. But yeah, Adam um, Adam Weissmuller was uh, the the promoter in Detroit immediately before uh, that era. There was all if you go back even further, there was Nick Landis, who was no relation to Jim, but he was the guy who ran the originally ran the Olympia Auditorium, and but and, but and that would have been I, I I didn't put it in the book because I wasn't a hundred percent sure, but I believe that the Sheik. And his family or Eddie and his family were wrestling fans. And I think he may have been going to shows as a kid, even in the 30s. And he may have seen some of those Londis cards. Um, but I, I didn't put it in there because I wasn't 100 percent sure. That's and well, you mentioned Burt Ruby and he and the Sheik had a long relationship. Burt Ruby was still used as um, was he not as a figurehead promoter, even when Sheik took over the territory in some places? He was, and this turned out to be kind of a point of contention, I have to say, or maybe kind of just lingering bad blood. So uh, some people may know this, but Bert Ruby has a son who lives out in California. He's uh, he's no kid himself these days, but he is a, a high-powered sports lawyer, and he has some very – and I think Hollywood too. He has some high-profile clients. I think Deion Sanders was a client of his. And so I found him, and I reached out to him. And I wanted to interview him for the book. And the impression that I got, and in fact, he kind of said this directly to me. He said, I'd be happy to talk to you about my dad. I'd be happy to talk to you about Detroit. In those days, I will not talk to you about the Sheik. Wow. And, yeah. And so the feeling from when I started digging around, I got the sense that so Ruby helped break Farhat into the business. He kind of discovered him. He brought him to Harry Light. He helped to groom him. And then I think what wound up happening is when when Farhat took over Detroit and he bought it out from Barnett and Doyle, Burt Ruby was still running the, the smaller towns. And I think he gradually may have just sort of pushed him out. Mm-hmm. And it might have been a feeling of, you know, well, I, I brought you into this business and you and you did this to me. And, and there was maybe some bad blood there. Well, and uh, so if. Unfortunately, if the Sheik was alive today, he wouldn't have any success in Hollywood because Burt Ruby's son would get even. <laughs> Maybe, um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, the Sheik, again, was so um, unique in wrestling because he had several different eras of stardom, and each one successively it kind of got bigger. He was on network television in the 50s, the Sheik of Araby, and... As you mentioned in the book, he got wilder at that point, but still it wasn't the the late 60s, 70s chic with the pencil and the fire and the drooling and the crazy and mayhem. But then when network television went away and they concentrated basically in the Midwest, chic and Bruiser, Wilbur Snyder, Bob Ellis, and a few of the other guys that Barnett really had great success with they were the major wrestling stars of the midwest which kind of set chic up to to take over the detroit promotion in in 64 but um he and bruiser it it kind of rivaled each other in a lot of those midwest towns bruiser might be the top star in one chic might be the top star in the other and it's kind of ironic that they ended up settling in their home states that were bordering each other and then later on having a promotional war. Yeah, and and there was even um, everybody, well, people who who know the stuff, there was a big wrestling war that happened in the early 70s, of course, where Bruiser tried to move into Detroit. But before that, even uh, uh, immediately after Sheik took over, um, there was a very brief war where Bruiser came in, and this would have been about 64, and tried to do it then, but it was extremely short-lived. Yeah. And uh, he sort of felt like, you know, Bruiser was kind of the bully. You know, the Sheik had bought things out. I don't want to say legally, because I don't think any of this would have stood up in a court of law. <laughs> but he but he felt he did it the fair way. You know, he paid money for it. Money changed hands. Right, money he changed hands. Change hands. 
And Bruiser just said, screw that. I'm just going to take it because the territory used to be both combined when, right. when Barnett and Doyle were running it and it kind of broke in half. And so Bruiser always had that attitude of, well, I'm going to, I'm going to take it all. You know, I, I took this part and I'm going to take it all. And I think too, you have to remember, and maybe I think sometimes people don't realize that the Bruiser was Dick, the Bruiser was originally, uh, we have to say it a, a much bigger star than Sheik of Araby was, I yeah. mean, you know, in the pre before Sheik took over, um, he was a mid carder essentially. And maybe in some areas he was, he was main eventing like down in Amarillo and stuff, but he was, but in that area, fans would have known him as a mid carder and bruiser had already been a major star for years. But of course the Sheik, you know, when you own your own territory, then he, you know, he elevated himself to be a star of, of equal stature. Yeah, that that's true. Bruiser, uh, by far was the, you know, he was one of the biggest drawing cards in the business in the mid and late fifties off the network TV and, and just his persona and, and she had not been used to that level. So I'm, I'm sure Bruiser did say, oh, this fucking guy, but at the same point, you know, they had the, the, the hometown advantage Sheik being from Michigan. He knew people he could go in and he could homestead that thing, just like Bruiser did Indiana because of his mother's political connections and the fact that he had been since he was a star high school football player there and it sort of set up that Hatfields and McCoys thing with Indiana and Michigan bordering each other but that that's a tribute to Jim Barnett the territory that he ran for those years with Ohio Indiana Michigan Kentucky into West Virginia um and it was doing big business in all of those towns uh, if Cincinnati was a a bigger town in the fifties than it ever even became in the, you know, in the days of the territory seventies and eighties. But finally with his chic in charge in Detroit starting in 1964 and Bruiser and Snyder in Indiana, same year, as you mentioned, Sheik starts building himself up in Detroit and it took a couple of years, but by when did Detroit really start doing the mega business was it around 67 68 i know it got hotter in the 70s the early 70s with the promotional war but he was already doing good you look back at those old body press programs and there's every name in the nwa from the midwest that's on these cards and and they're you know every two weeks it's just mega events I was going to say about 67 would be would be at that that whole late 60s early 70s is really the heyday where the the business is just on fire and it's kind of weird to think about it because during that time frame you could make a case that it might have been the hottest promotion in the in the country or or in you know but then it just kind of burned out but by the late 60s yeah it had become huge to the point where even you know, the Sheik worked for um, the McMahons. He worked for Capital Wrestling in the late 50s, and he was, you know, a tag team wrestler. He was with Bull Curry. He was a, he was a mid Carter. But then by the late 60s, on the strength of, you know, the, the magazines and how uh, he was main eventing and going, you know, touring the country, they brought him in for that feud with with Bruno in 69 or 68 going into 69. And it couldn't have been more different. Ten years ago, he was a he was a tag team oddity, and now he's you know selling out the Garden and and Philadelphia and Baltimore and all over the place with Bruno San Martino. And at the same time, the business that he was doing in Detroit attracted the attention of the Tunnies in Toronto because obviously it's a different country. But D Detroit, for the people around the world who don't know the geography, Detroit and Toronto are 250 miles apart. It's four hour drive. And yeah. some of the TV in Michigan and uh, Ontario overlaps as well. Uh, cause the TV signals don't know international borders. So with the Sheik doing that kind of business down the road, that's he got the uh, not only got a spot in Toronto, but then finally got the booking deal where Tunney was using the Detroit talent. And that gave Sheik not only a hot city like Detroit, but one of the great North American wrestling cities that was under his control and the Maple Leaf Gardens that seated you know, almost 20,000 people. And that's where he had that famous or or maybe infamous 
127 match um, undefeated streak where he didn't lose a in a single uh, one on one match for 127 straight times. And I think that Tunney maybe regretted uh, it, it became almost like a Faustian bargain, you know, yeah. where, where he brought in the Sheik to be this headliner and booker and then he couldn't get rid of him and he just wouldn't stop booking himself on top and beating everybody. I mean, he's beating Luthez in multiple appearances. He's beating San Martino up there and 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 Gene Kaniski and the Funks and just whoever he wants. And uh, the people just got sick of it after a while. Well, and then also, I, I don't even want to jump ahead, but it, it that since you brought it up, the straw that broke the camel's back was often pointed to as the match with Andre. Right. Where, well, I, and I've seen the video. Um, it lasted four minutes and fireball to the face. Andre rolls out selling and the Sheik gets disqualified. And still the Sheik doesn't get beat. Right. That that really seems to be the turning point. And, and it, you know, you can, like you said, you can see that match. It's it's floating around. It's on YouTube. It's been on video, you know, put out there. And yeah, I think that was the point where the people just had enough because I, I looked it up and um, this was I think it was 73 or four. So Andre was still kind of on the ascendancy. Right. He wasn't he was a huge star, but he was going to get even bigger. And he had not lost a match. I'll rephrase that. There wasn't a match that he hadn't won in a year, no matter where he went anywhere. And that was the one where he, you know, even I think the fans were just sort of like, do you mean to tell me that this guy can't even he can't even lay down for Andre the Giant? I mean, give me a break. You know, he threw fire in his face and Andre gets counted out and he wins the match that That's way. That's right. It was a count out, not a disqualification. Right. It was, yeah, it was, it was, it was not, I, I don't believe he was counted out of the ring. I think it was just because of the fire. Yeah. He was incapacitated. Uh, it's just, it's a very weak uh, way to get out of it. But, but, but here's the thing now, let, now we're not trying to tear the sheik down. And by the name, mm -hmm. by the way, the name of the book again, blood and fire by Brian Solomon. But would you say that this is also a fair estimate before the hot shotting and the won't get off the top and the won't put anybody else over or make a new star inevitably did what all those things do in wrestling between 1967 and 1974. And I'll, I'll preface this by saying they just released the WWE figures. They sold 600 and some thousand tickets last year. Of course, that was a pandemic and that's all over the world, including stadium shows, whatever. But of recent years, the WWE in the entire world has been selling, what, a little over a million tickets per year. In Michigan, just the state of Michigan and the province of Ontario, in that seven-year run between 1967 and 1974, do you think it's fair to say the Sheik sold five million tickets or more in just those two places? That would be very fair because, you know, and you guys have talked about it so many times, the whole structure of the business was so different because you're talking about the Sheik running Kobo Arena, which is a 12,000, I think even 12,500 12, seat building every other week and sometimes every week and, and um, selling it out or coming close to selling it out all the time. And so, I mean, that adds up and you, you could never do that today, but they were in, but that was their market, you know, in the same way that the, you know, the WWF was running Madison square garden every month and selling it out. I mean, that that's the the way they did it. So not only would I say that, that, that number is, is very realistic, but he was out drawing anybody you could name, you know, music acts, rock bands, whoever, you know, he, the, God knows he was, he was out drawing the Detroit Pistons. They were terrible at that time. <laughs> That was one of their worst periods. So he was, it was like, uh, you know, Dave Brzezinski calls Kobo the house that the Sheik built. And I think that's fair. Yeah. And I mean, just in uh, per year in Detroit and Toronto, you're looking at close at over 400,000 tickets a year, just those two cities alone. And that's with him flying around and also main eventing in Los Angeles. He was on the, the LA, uh, the Olympic uh, stadium, or not the Olympic, the LA Coliseum card. Uh, with Blassie and Tolos that drew 27,000 people. He was on the card of the U.S. title, Sheik versus Bobo Brazil. He was a guest star everywhere that 
any of the promoters that were in, you know, good graces with him or he was in good graces with them or whatever. There was a few. Sam Muchnick was not a fan. No. But he was everywhere. And that's I say this because we talk about his hot shotting and uh, the too much hardcore, too much blood, the constant, just the constant barrage of it. It works. That's what hot shotting is. And that also people forget today because they do. Everybody's allowed to do everything they want. The Sheik was unique. He was the only one doing this level of violence and carnage and mayhem. Everything that you weren't supposed to be able to do because it would burn a town out or, you know, hurt the business. He was the one guy that was doing it. That's why it got over. And that's why most promoters would bring him in as an attraction as like, is something wicked this way comes this week? You're not going to see it again for a year, but this week he's going to set the fucking building on fire. And, yeah. that, and that's what worked in all those other territories, but his, his got hotter quicker and stayed hot and then completely burnt out. Well, yeah, that's because he was always there. Because like he was you, always there. Like you said, you know, if he's coming in to L.A. or New York or or Texas or wherever he's going and people know that this is a special thing, it was special. But when you're constantly doing the same thing and to the Detroit fans, you know, they knew that that's what they were going to see every time. I even wrote in the book that he was it was almost like he was the anti Bruno. <laughs> 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 He he even seemed to model his booking uh, uh, on what Vince Senior was doing, except replacing a beloved babyface with an absolutely reviled heel, which which didn't yeah. really have the same legs, you know. But but he had the ability, which uh, honestly, a lot of the promoters who had their own territory that were also wrestlers, once they got a territory, they kind of stopped touring and he was an exception to that where you know when Vern Gagne is running the AWA he's pretty much sticking to the AWA or, or Fritz von Erich in Dallas and things like that but the Sheik was still and in fact doing it more than ever touring the country and the world even while he was running his own territory well he had a healthy ego yes. uh, and and he liked being in the main events he liked going to Los Angeles LaBelle would bring him in so he could go shopping on Rodeo drive and get the custom made suits. And he liked the, you know, the travel and the, the attention and et cetera. But uh, you, you mentioned because we ought to put you on to, on to Trump. Cause you got Sheik's tax returns for at least <laughs> one year. Um, he reported now, and we've talked about on the program here about how a lot of the business in those days was done in cash, but he reported personal income of in what one year in the early seventies of over $400,000, which would be somewhere around what couple million in today's money. Yeah. And I mean, he's living in a house that has 40 rooms. It's a giant estate. And just to give you an idea, that house today is run as a hotel. It still <laughs> exists <laughs> and it has like a catering hall space uh, and that was just his house. And it was made, it was built for him. Uh, it was designed for him. You know, he was, he was really making just money that is incalculable. Like you said, when you're declaring 400,000, especially in wrestling, you had to imagine he was actually bringing in a whole lot more than that. I mean, he'd be coming back from Japan and I don't even know how he got away with this. The story was that he's coming back with his boots just filled with money and his <laughs> suitcase just filled with money because they're paying him thousands of dollars, you know, for a match. And when you think about it, he's going out there for like four minutes. I mean, that's not a bad way to make a living. Well, and I'm just wondering if you go to Williamston, Michigan, can you uh, stay in the Bobo Brazil honeymoon <laughs> suite there at that um but no, I've I've heard from the guys in those in the sixties and seventies days when money for the Americans in Japan got really good, but there was nobody had figured that out uh, related to the government yet. The guys would come back with cash strapped to them, in bags, in in, in their underwear, in linings of jackets. It was insane. Yeah, and. Um, I, 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 the story I also heard was that one of the one of the guy's wives got pissed at him when they were getting divorced and stooged him off to the government. That kind of 
ruined it for everybody. But um, you mentioned Japan about the time that Detroit started dying because the promotional war between Sheik and Bruiser was over. They had when Bruiser was running Detroit opposite the Sheik the same night. Sheik would sell out twelve thousand in the Kobo. Bruiser sometimes would put six or eight thousand on a few occasions. In the Olympia, there'd be twenty thousand people going to wrestling in Detroit on the same night, and this was when there were multiple shows a month. But then Bruiser finally pulls out back to Indiana. They settle it and they do the the grudge matches, which drew. But after that, what are they going to follow it with? We've talked about Indiana, how that Bruiser couldn't keep enough towns in one state running to keep the big name talent in the territory that he'd had. Sheik had more markets, Ohio and Michigan, but his talent started aging because like Bruiser, he never changed it and he didn't change himself. So a couple of years later, both of the territories that were two of the hottest in the country are on their ass. But all of a sudden Sheik goes to Japan and he's a fucking big star again after he's been in the wrestling business for 30 years. Yeah, because uh, ironically, the turning point for his domestic business was when the feud, when the war ended with Bruiser, because that the things just start to plummet after 74. It was like, um, you know, it, it generated interest in his business and people were coming out to see it. And then once he won, his business kind of started to go down. And part of it, too, is because once they decided to start working together, you've got Dick the Bruiser, you've got the Sheik. Neither guy ever wants to lose to anybody. So so now they have to <laughs> feud with each other. And I listed in the book, I listed all their big matches that they had coming out of the promotional war. Yes. And there is not a single definitive win for either man they go through a feud that goes through every town in both territories and nobody I saw wins. a couple of them yeah nobody won nobody won any yeah. of them even cage matches so you know then yeah he goes to japan and well now he, wait a minute now wait a minute one time i think of um <laughs> didn't uh, bruiser won a cage match by pinfall over creechman at one point I think. right <laughs> right so there would always be they would find a way so they would do but, a tag and they did team tag match. matches. Poor right. Bobby Heenan. As my, I have in my office here the chair, one of the chairs from the Market Square Arena, when they settled the war and Bruiser brought Sheik into Indianapolis and ran the big building, he put Bobby in his corner because Bobby had the most heat of anybody, you know, in his territory. And that's when not only did they not have a real finish, but also uh, Bruiser gave Bobby a payoff on a near sellout in market square arena of almost uh, i think like 600 bucks or whatever and that's when bobby called Vern, said fuck it i'm done so it. it it the the settling of the war was the worst thing that happened to both guys companies but it, i'm sorry like you said so Sheik then goes to japan yeah he went and and really it was it was baba i know he did one tour which was kind of interesting not even a tour he did kind of a weekend for Anoki. And something went really wrong because what you see in the book is that a lot of guys were constantly trying to run against him. You know, they weren't there was not a lot of loyalty, you know, and and um, a lot of his own people would jump ship and try to run an outlaw promotion. And there was one time when he went to Japan, it's like they were waiting for him to leave. They, they were actually yeah. waiting for him to leave the country. And the minute he did, it was like Mark Lewin, Killer Tim Brooks. I think even his booker, everybody, Jack Kane, who was his booker, they started a company and he had to rush back. And apparently he really burned Anoki because he had to kind of blow off some of the matches they had scheduled. And that's why he never worked for him again. And he had to run back to the U.S. to sort of put out the fire. But they even used that when when um, the Sheik was tied in with the Ali Anoki stuff. He was being put out there as one of Muhammad Ali's quote unquote trainers. <laughs> and they I don't know what he was gonna teach Muhammad Ali, but <laughs> how to but throw they, fire. <laughs> Ali with the fire. Down goes Frazier. <laughs> Maybe that would have made it watchable. I don't know. But but they made it out where they were trying to say that the Sheik still had bad blood with Inoki over that tour. And that's why he was helping Muhammad Ali to fight Antonio Inoki. But most of his Japanese tours were, it was Baba. And yeah, he became 
one of the biggest uh, American stars over there, which was weird because he wasn't even supposed to be American, but he technically was an American wrestling in Japan. Well, and Baba was so straight as a promoter and, you know, Japanese wrestling was so highly athletic and what 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 the modern fans imagine that Japanese wrestling is now is what it actually was then. It was treated as a real sport. Everyone was an athlete in shape. They trained their young boys' ass off. And then along comes the Sheik, who is completely different. And, of course, he's 50 years old now, but he's got Abdullah the Butcher for a tag team partner, and they've got the Funks to work with. And the Funks are over in Japan and they're legends in Japan and the Sheik and Dory senior went back a long way because Sheik, uh, the smallest territory that the Sheik ever worked on a regular basis was Amarillo because they, they had a relationship. So now you've got the land of sports based wrestling with the Sheik and Abdullah, the butcher in it and the funks know how to work with them. And it was completely different and the people went crazy for it. Yeah, and and he stood out, like we were saying before. I mean, it, it was like – and you can watch a lot of it because thank, thankfully they preserved a lot of their video footage a, a lot better yeah. than, than most American companies did. And you can see some of this, and he comes out, and it's almost like he's from another planet. Like he just he just walked out of a portal from another dimension or something. The way the, the, the crowd is reacting to him. And just people fleeing in terror. I mean, you always talk about fans being afraid of him in general, but you really see it here. I mean, he'll just turn his head and you'll see about 30 people just run about yeah. 10, 10 feet in the other direction. And he didn't even do anything. And then they do this kind of unusual thing, which if you ever see it um, in Japan, they have a, a superstition, right? That if if there's something you're afraid of, if you touch it, it's good luck. I don't know the origin of that, but that's why you'll see people running up to the sheik and quickly touching him. It's almost like the like the the cavemen in 2001 yes. with, with the monolith. They'll tap him and then run away really quickly. It's it's like they're running up and and touching a hot stove where they they know that they're scared to death and it's going to be dangerous, but they got to do it once and then they run back. Right. It's it's wild and I've seen that in person with it, 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 when the Sheik was in, in, I saw him in Market Square Arena on another occasion uh, against Bruiser in a cage again a couple years later. And this time he came out with the boa constrictor. And I'm sitting with my mom on the third row, right? I'm, uh, what would I be, 14, 15, whatever. And as soon as the Sheik came out and came around the corner of the ring, he just lurched. Without moving, he just kind of like made the move like he was going to lurch toward the front row and grown men jumped up and dove over the backs of the seats onto the people in the second row. And here comes people jumping over the top of us. And we're like, what the fuck? Just from him just making a motion like I'm coming that way. He had crowd control, the likes of which it's it's hard to explain now because people don't react to wrestlers in person the same way as they did then. But this, you knew this guy and he was potentially dangerous. If you didn't fucking run, he was going to do something. Yeah. I've I always heard when I got in the business or around the business as a photographer, that Mike Lauren, Porky Pig, that folks, that was the name. He, he was a preliminary wrestler, nondescript balding looking guy named Porky Pig but he was not only that he would wrestle on cards when the sheik was out of his territory because he'd drive the sheik in the limo. And also I've heard that he was there to take the bump. If the sheik bladed, ripped up, cut, stretched, hurt in some way, one of the fans had tried to attack him. Did you ever hear anything to corroborate that? I know that he acted as his bodyguard a lot of the time, actually. I have a, a picture in the book where it almost looks like a scene out of Goodfellas where <laughs> they're they're in the parking lot getting out of the car. And so, you know, they're in they're in their civilian clothes and, you know, the sheik has this long trench coat on and Mike Loren is there with these dark shades on. So apparently he was kind of like his, uh, I don't know, muscle or whatever you want to call it. And I think he even... He might. He was a, a a police officer. I don't know if he was retired or if he still was a police officer at the time. But but yeah, he he would be used basically in whatever way that that the sheik needed 
for him to be used, you know, because they had this thing where if, if a fan is coming at you, well, then you have to do something because if you don't do something, then it exposes everything. So so it's almost like they're putting him in that position. And that's why people, a lot of people told me that Sheik used to walk around with those with those razors, those blades taped to his fingers and things. It was partly in case he needed to to kind of cut one of the fans. I mean, crowd control. Put, yeah, not to put too fine a point on it. I mean, in case he needed to just slice. Now, somebody. now I'll, I'll, I see what you did there with that. <laughs> not to put too fine a point on it. There you go. I know uh, you got in trouble for claiming that the Sheik used razor blades, but you know, his son Captain Ed George was indignant that we would. Yeah accuse the sheik of using blades in the ring or outside apparently but no as i've seen a newspaper article in my collection somewhere and i believe i'd heard the story from the locker room where a guy attacked the sheik and the sheik you know just with his blade fingers and apparently it in the newspaper article it said the guy was knocked through a plate glass door in the process of being arrested and <laughs> suffered cuts. <laughs> yeah. L Lanny Poffo told me a story because he had, he started out him and Randy, both of them started out working for the Sheik when they were very young. And um, apparently I guess he was in a match with Sheik and there was a riot and he's trying to protect him, you know, cause he was kind of an older guy and, and he wanted to make sure he didn't get hurt or anything. And he was just shocked how quick the Sheik was with the blade. I think he, he mentioned to me that he he reached out and he slashed somebody. I don't think it was a fan. It might have been uh, – it might have even been – it was someone who got involved in the match and he slashed him. And Lanny said he was so upset just seeing that happen and how quick and, and unreluctant he was to do it. He said just the image just stuck with him for days. He couldn't get it out of his head. Well, and that's the thing is it, you can't imagine the heat that the Sheik had. And, and for the younger listeners, we talk about that all the time also. But you, you could feel in the buildings when this guy was doing his thing, you could feel the people rumbling like there was a lot of people that if they thought they could get away with it, they would have. That was the only thing stopping them is either... I'm going to go to jail or more importantly, this guy's going to fuck me up because they, they believed in him and, and they'd heard a lot of those stories, but the heat that he had, you know, he wasn't going to, he wasn't going to stand out there in the crowd and speak to people while he's wearing swimming trunks and, you know, <laughs> empty handed. And here comes the crowd. He's going to get back to the locker room and deal with it. However he needs to. Right. And there's the story in the book, too, about um, there was a guy who and, and I think this might have been even more than one person. There was a guy who was a so-called legitimate athlete. Maybe he might have been an amateur wrestler or something. And he was running his mouth about how the Sheik was a phony and he knew who he really was. No, I, I'll tell you, he was, he you know, was the from story. the University of Michigan. It's in behind go. the curtain. It's in That's behind it. the curtain. Right. My my wonderful graphic novel. That, <laughs> That's in the book, too. That yeah, hopefully you... will rival your uh, your sales. But yeah, the the shooter, he and this was, you know, in, in Detroit one time that the, the shooter from one of the local colleges thought pro wrestling was bullshit and he had found out because of the local connection that the sheik was really ed farhad and he comes in like he said and and starts running his mouth and somebody goes and gets the sheik and the sheik comes out and the guy turns around and looks at him and a sheik's hand just shot out around the guy's neck pinned him up against the wall and nose to nose with him just real quietly because nobody ever heard sheik speak english hmm. he said my name is ed farhat and I will kill you. <laughs> and the guy, oh, and he let him go, and the guy took off, and nobody ever saw him again. Right. If you yeah. looked in those eyes, you would believe that you were doomed. That was the thing about him that everybody talked about was the eyes. He would go into that zone he was in, and you looked in the eyes, and you said, "Okay, this is this ain't a work." Very intense, and he had those dark eyebrows, just heavy eyebrows very menacing expression that he always had on his face. And he would even use that in everyday life. Apparently, if he was trying to intimidate people, he would just kind of flash <laughs> them a look. But, you know, before I forget, I want to mention too the that Market Square Arena match, the steel cage uh, with Bruiser and Sheik. There's a photo from that match in the book. So, oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. There's a picture from it. 
I got to look for me in the third row. Um, <laughs> well, it's a close up. So, you know, I don't know. But then, you know, as as often happens with a lot of celebrities in a variety of of endeavors. He couldn't quit. He couldn't stop. He couldn't stop being the chic. It went into the when the the whole FMW thing and they've set him on fire. I mean, a lot of a lot more people today may know about the Sheik's 90s exploits in Japan with Onita, the exploding ring and all the other stuff because of the FMW dark side of the ring and things like that. This has been gone over. But this is a guy, the Sheik, at that time, he was. Almost, he was almost 70 or right past 70 when he was doing some of this stuff. And even though, I mean, he looked not good. And even though he had all that magnetism from years gone by, he just, it, it had gone too far. You couldn't summon that. It, 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 it was reputation only by that point. And the name and the, it was sort of like a freak show thing. The Sheik is going to be in the barbed wire exploding fire ring match and whatever. And it just is kind of sad. Well, it's it's like it was the only place he could go, basically, because it's people have said, you know, when you become a legend in Japan, they don't forget about you like they do here. And there's some truth to that, because there were there were a lot of people that were still willing to buy into it in a way that they had already abandoned long before in the United States. I mean, he had he was a non-entity by that point. I mean, by the time you even get to the end of the 70s into the 80s, no one even wants to work with him. And his act was just stale and he was just seen as a dinosaur. But but they wanted him and Onita especially wanted him because Onita had remembered him from working for Baba. Onita was a young boy. Onita was carrying his yeah. bags and things. And the Sheik was like a god to him. And I, at the time, people weren't even sure over there if he was still around, if he was still alive, let alone wrestling. And and they they somehow got a hold of him, contacted him. And his condition, of course, was I'll come, but my nephew has to come with me, which is it kind of serves two purposes with Sabu, because number one, there's the idea that his uncle and this is very true, was trying to help his career and was trying to really get him seen by the right people. But there was also the element of I need somebody that is going to be able to do the work because, yeah. I can't, you know, he could hardly even get in the ring at that point. But but, you know, he 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 had fallen on hard times. I mean, that's that's the fact of it is that he he needed money. He was in poor shape. He was in poor health. And it was an opportunity. They were offering him ten thousand dollars a match. How in the world? Could you say no to that? I mean, I would say yes to that now, and I've never even been the ring. So, um, because it was what the the run with Baba. What was the last? They they just they changed after what the early eighties. It just it it wasn't going to go anymore. The newer generation of Baba's talent was coming in, and and he spent Sheik spent most of the eighties not making any money, and like you said, you know that forty room mansion and etc everything fell into disrepair it just he he had lived so big i mean the stories of him dropping you know tens of thousands of dollars in las vegas at the nwa meeting at the crap table and not even blinking now you know the income had been cut off and he couldn't go out and do that again so the i think i got to see his last hurrah in person the 88 great american bash in detroit that would have been the last really mainstream appearance he did in the United States and drew the biggest crowd in uh, Crockett history in Detroit. Yeah, that was the last because time he was on the card. That was the last time he worked for a major American promotion. And all, I mean, by 81 was the he, last. he was booked. He was booked the next month. And you remember that right. story? Uh, he, he no showed because they didn't send him 10 grand. The, the first show drew a hundred grand and the Sheik always gets 10%. They didn't send him 10 grand. So he no showed the next one, even though he needed money. Right. And, but these were the kinds of just bad decision-making that was going on <laughs> at the time. I mean, you know, but that's part of what contributed to all of it. And the thing with Baba, his last tour was 81 in Japan for Baba. Yeah. And part of the reason for that too, was the fact that in 82, he wound up getting blacklisted by the. National Wrestling Alliance for working with Jim Wilson and Thunderbolt Patterson and running against Jim Barnett in Atlanta 
And so Baba is an NWA member. So that was also another reason why. I mean, he, yes, he was getting old and the act was getting old, but uh, there was also that. And that, that, you know, when you think that's not a great decision because obviously and everybody knew Jim Wilson and Thunderbolt Patterson were not going to make a go of a promotion in Atlanta. That thing was a fiasco from the start. And, and Sheik also was working for the Poffos ICW because they had had a relationship since Randy and Lanny worked there. Uh, obviously, Sheik and Angelo had known each other for years and years since the 50s, and Randy and Lanny had worked in Detroit, so he was trying to help them, but that put him on the outs with, well, honestly, all the American promoters that probably weren't going to book him anyway, but at least he he didn't have to piss Bob off. He had a tough relationship with the other NWA promoters anyway. He was sort of like a – he was kind of the black sheep. I mean, they just uh, – the, the, the relationship he had with Mushnick – was kind of emblematic of that, where they they kept him at arm's length, sort of. They there's a letter that's in the book that Tim Hornbaker, who is the king of research, I mean, I just bow bow to him, but he had a letter that a couple of letters between Sam Mushnick and uh, Johnny Doyle, and even and they're talking about how they're embarrassed at the idea that the yeah. Sheik is the is the promoter in Detroit and. They're afraid or embarrassed to even tell people because it just makes the business look bad. So there was a lot of that, too. And and that, I think, was partly why he was running against them. He just felt, screw it. My company's out of business. Nobody helped me out. So screw these guys. I'm going to do what I want. Well, you know, the other promoters, there was an element. I mean, he had the personal friends that we've talked about. But there was an element of this is freak show bullshit. We don't want that. Uh, I've I've told the story that. When Jerry Jarrett was trying to get television in Cincinnati in the early 80s after Sheik had already folded and gone away before Crockett ended up getting TV and making Cincinnati a massive success, right? Jerry Jarrett and Lance Russell went up there and the station manager, I think it was Channel 5, which was the last station that aired Sheik's program up there. He said, come back here, I want to show you something. And he went in his office and he took a tape off his shelf so you know this is something that he had kept there on purpose right and he sticks it in the machine and it's the sheik got a job guy on his studio tv he's got a snake he's got the guy over the ropes he's got the snake in one hand and a blade in the other hand and because it's a close-up you can see him blading the guy instead of the sheik instead of the snake biting him causing blood he's cutting him with the razor blade it's a close-up yeah and i and think and that's when the the manager said this right here is why I will never have pro wrestling on my television station. And they just had to get up and walk out. Because that's the thing. It, The same thing that the Sheik did to sell all those millions of tickets because of the heat and the chaos, it turned off the people that you needed to partner with in order to run the promotion, the TV or the newspapers or whatever that didn't want to get involved in that, which then led to, uh, you know, uh, other promoters potentially being penalized because of the, you know, what that style, the taste it left in people's mouth. So that was at the root of a lot of the issues with him and the other promoters. Yeah, and they were more than happy to book him when he was making them a lot of money. You know, they maybe they held yeah. their noses and did it, but they did it. But then once that stopped happening, I think that was the point where everybody was like, well, we don't need this guy anymore. So we're going to, yeah. you know, we're going to just kind of leave him out in the cold. And, and, and you could control that, as we mentioned, by bringing him in, you know, sparingly and then backing off on any chaos. But like you said, it also came down to, but yes, he will put people in the building. Just cold, just the no angle. Doesn't he, he never did promos. Just to advertise the chic, and everybody knew, oh shit, something's gonna fucking happen. Yeah. Um, and, and but then if we talked about the the sad days in Japan when he was older and he went with Sabu and they set him on and that's the thing that pretty much contributed to the last big decline in his health when they set him on fucking fire, right? Yeah, he had he had a heart attack. I mean, they had a they had that fire match where the ropes are on fire, everything's on fire. And here's this guy, I mean, pushing 70, and the 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 barbed wire is melting because of the fire. 
and they're in there and he could hardly get in the ring. So how's he going to get out? You know, and you've got uh, it, it's I think Tarzan Goto and, and Onita and and Sabu and the, and they're flying out of the ring. And then Sabu, you know, he flies out of the ring and then thinks, oh, my God, my uncle's still in there. He looks <laughs> back. He sees the poor guy in there and you got to remember, you know, and I'm thinking this when I'm writing it, we think of the Sheik and he's this monster and he's this maniac. This, this is a grandfather. This is somebody's grandpa. Now this is with an artificial hip, right? This is this poor old guy and he's stuck in there and they had to go in there and get him out. And he, he's got, you know, all these burns on his back and you watch the video of it and he's outside the ring finally. And he's still in character. The guy is still taking swipes, throwing fire, yelling and, you know, in his, in his gibberish and everything. And he's, he's burning up from fire. And then I guess he, he slipped into a coma after that and got out of, you know, he, he, they sent him home early. I mean, I guess, I guess yeah, that, oh, well, shucks. Yeah. Coma, <laughs> he went back. might as well go home. But then he came back. He took a couple of weeks off. Uh, some people, I, I think sometimes people think that was the end of it. It wasn't. He took a couple of weeks off, recovered, and then went back and, and, and kept working. And that, you know, and again, when we talk about you just can't give it up, you just can't quit. A lot of stars, a lot of celebrities don't know when to say, I've done it, enough is enough. And that's a classic example, but still you got to admire the guy's commitment 50 years, almost after he started in this business, he still wants to be himself. He still, that's the sad part about it is that he was still in his own mind. He was still the Sheik, and a lot of people, you know, the Sheik was still uppermost in their minds. He just didn't look like necessarily the Sheik anymore at that point. And then that's where it was. It was sad, but he had, as we mentioned at the top of the interview, gone to so many lengths all through his life to keep people from knowing the real deal. We've told the stories that even when, when Bobo Brazil would come over to the fucking house, he'd eat in a different room than the Sheik so that the family wouldn't see him sitting together. You know, he went to that kind of lengths to create this this image, this persona of the Sheik and carried it till the, the day he died, including in the, uh, the, this is the most poignant capper I can think of for his story. You mentioned, and we'd heard that, that the, the preacher at his funeral called him by his real name once and referred to him as Sheik for the rest of the ceremony. Yeah, that's true. And I even reached out to that guy. Believe it or not, I found <laughs> the priest because I have the uh, I have a copy of the funeral card and, and that's in the book as well, but with the name of the reverend. And, you know, we talked a little bit and he confirmed it that um, that was the case that they you know, everyone just called him chic. His grandkids called him Grandpa Sheik. His, yeah. you know, his his nieces and nephews called him Uncle Sheik, and that's just uh, who he was. Uh, Joyce called him Sheik. I mean... If if you called on the phone and asked for Ed, he would cuss you out and hang up. There's no Ed here. I, I called once to the Sheik in 1988. Kevin Sullivan gave me his number. He said when I'd done promos plugging the Great American Bash in Detroit, I'd mentioned the Sheik also and done a little promo for that just because for fun, nobody told me to do it, but I love the Sheik. And Kevin Sullivan said, he liked it. He wants you to call him. And I called and he said, make sure you ask for Sheik. <laughs> well, and, he, and he knew. He was very difficult to understand because he had that fast way of talking with that kind of accent. But, uh, he, you know, he just, he, the Sheik thanked me for doing a promo for him. So I've, I've joined the company of Eddie Creechman and Abdullah Farouk. But, um, but Brian, last, you have, uh, you've been silent through this whole ordeal, but uh, you've jumped in on this book also and, and have read uh, some of it that's coming out on April 12th. Pre-orders are available now at, at uh, you can order at Amazon. And uh, if you pre-order the book, you will get yours first come first serve. So don't wait till April 12th because by then they may be in a back printing. But anyway, Brian Last, do you have anything, any questions that we have not covered on this subject, The Sheik? Well, just one question I'll throw at Brian Solomon, who uh, 
did so much research and whose last name I feel compelled to use because there are two Brian's on the call. Yes. But Brian <laughs> Solomon, when you look at the decline of the Detroit territory, and you could say he was blackballed by 82, obviously he was out of business before then. And there was a period where everything felt like it was going downhill. You still hear people talk about big time wrestling, big time country. <laughs> oh boy. I'm yes. curious when you look at the downfall of the Sheik, how much of it was purely what we would now call the creative, the booking of the Sheik, the Sheik's booking of the Sheik, and how much of it would you say coincides with the decline of really Detroit, the decline of the Motor City, with the decline of the auto industry strictly being in, or not strictly, but primarily being in Michigan, in Detroit, and we would see as the decade of the 80s went on how it affected Detroit and the suburbs around it, but in terms of the decline of the area beyond wrestling, how much of that do you think contributed to the decline of the wrestling company? It's a complicated web of things, and the creative is only one of those things, and I don't even know if I would say it was the main thing, but it certainly didn't help. Um, like you said, I mean, Detroit was... Uh, becoming a wasteland, unfortunately. And, and we've seen that over the years, even after that. Detroit it ha has was becoming a city in crisis. The, the automotive industry drying up and even the parts manufacturers going elsewhere, uh, people leaving the city, the, the, a lot of urban blight and crime. I mean, even the Detroit Red Wings who played at the Olympia would have to, they started instituting um, you know, supervised parking because they had to prove to people that their cars wouldn't be stolen if they came <laughs> to the hockey games. And and sometimes people say that that contributed to the bruiser losing the war because he was at Olympia, which was in a tougher neighborhood than Kobo. And some people were afraid to go. But there's a lot of things that were going on. There were riots. I mean, I talk about in the book how in that era, that that summer of 67 and where you've got Riots happening everywhere. I think it might be 68 if 68. I come off on my year. 68. Uh, one of the biggest ones. I mean, it's historically big. It was like almost as as bad as something you'd see from the in the, the Civil War riots where they burned down all these buildings and people were killed and police and civilians and maimed and killed. This is all happening right around, you know, <laughs> these arenas. I talked about how the Sheik one of the reasons why he decided to drop the U.S. title to Bobo Brazil was to sort of give something to the people of Detroit th that were suffering from all this racial strife. And he was trying to give something back, at least to the fans, that they would finally get to see their hero, who was an African-American, defeat the hated Sheik. So, you know, the city was struggling for a long time. You also had things in the Sheik's personal life, too. And the way I address it in the book, you know, when I approach this, look, everybody has things in their life that they're not proud of. And, uh, you know, wrestlers, uh, uh, their lives on the road. And I, I didn't feel the need. I, I don't want to bury anybody. I don't, I don't want to just tell tales out of school and just kind of badmouth people for the sake of doing it. But the way I looked at it was if it's an integral part of the story, I can't leave it out. And I can't talk about the downfall of Sheik's wrestling promotion without talking about his personal contributions to that. You know, he had um, a surgery done. I think it was in 74 or five, might have even been 76. He had an operation to remove his his gallbladder. And in those days, that was I remember that big scar. Yes, right. He had that lightning bolt scar across his abdomen because in those days there was forget about laparoscopic. I mean, they were. Yeah. It was like, you know, the frog in, in biology class, uh, the way that they would get that out of you. And so the painkillers and stuff sort of put him on the road to addiction, sadly enough. And this was something that was very, I found was very hush hush. And understandably, even to this day, some people just didn't want to broach the topic. But there were people who did want, who were willing to broach the topic and confirm it. Because again, I'm not going to put it in the book unless I'm sure. But he did have those kind of struggles, and it was damaging his work. It was damaging uh, his reputation in the business. It was contributing to making very, very bad decisions. Um, he was having marital struggles with Joyce. There were periods where they were split up. And, and the reason that becomes also bad for business, too, is because Joyce was very well-liked 
Joyce was in some ways the behind the scenes of big time wrestling. And she was very well liked in the business. And so there was this attitude of, oh, why is he why is he doing that to Joyce? She doesn't deserve that, which you could understand because she had supported him through all this. She had I mean, think about it from her point of view. She was a 19 year old girl who got married into this crazy world. Her (laughs) husband is pretending to be this maniac and she has to go along with it. And she was all game for it. And then after all that, to sort of feel like your husband is betraying you, which which he was, you know, even though they did reconcile, all these things contributed to him taking his eye off the ball and letting his business just fall apart and go down the drain. And and Brian Brian Last, I can I can chime in also with in 1975, I finally talked my mom into we went up to visit Aunt Lola in Covington on a weekend when the Cincinnati Gardens was running. And every time I'd go to Aunt Lola's, I'd watch the Sheik's TV from Cincinnati. I'd been watching it for three years, hearing all these major stars advertise, Cincinnati Gardens, Cincinnati. So I, please, can we go? Well, of course, I was a year late because the war was over. And we go in there, 1975. I There may have been 400 people in the Cincinnati Gardens, which seats uh, a little over 10,000. The Sheik wasn't on the card, but the main event was Abdullah the Butcher against Bull Curry. Not a drop of blood. They used aluminum brass knuckles that they dropped out of the ring and they bounced on the (laughs) concrete floor. And I don't even know who was on the... I've still got the notes around here somewhere, but I don't remember who was on the undercard because it was the most boring, old, slow wrestling show I'd ever seen. Aunt Lola went to sleep in the chair in ringside. And so, and there weren't any riots in Cincinnati at that point. Nothing was on fire. It was just a bad show. So there were other things besides what was going on in Detroit. It just, the bloom was off the rose. Brian, from all the research you did, how many times was the box office robbed? I'm doing air quotes (laughs) over here. In the late 70s. Um, Well, People told me uh, I would get multiple stories of that happening. Um, I used one of them in there, which is the most famous one, which is the Funks. Yeah, that's the one that everybody remembers. And, you know, I had to go back. And uh, when I sent the manuscript in to ECW Press, I got some new information and I actually asked them for permission to change something in there because I thought it was important. And I think it came from Dave, actually, Brzezinski, which is that the Sheik was not there when that happened. And I think that that is it's important to know that because I don't know if that was just something that they were trying to pull because he wasn't there or if that's something that he would do even when he was there. But he wasn't on that show. It was a Kobo show where the business was going down and the Funks who were very loyal to him, like you said, because he had known their father and they went way back. They kind of took it they went out of the way to help him. They went down there and, and when it came time to get paid, yeah, I mean, Eddie Jr. ran in and complaining that they just had the cash box robbed and they couldn't pay anybody. And um, I think that he told me, Terry told me that story himself. Now <laughs> I've heard that it happened a few other times, but that that's the only confirmed story that I got of it. When you talk about problems that the Sheik and the territory had in the late 70s, you know, towards its decline, and there were a lot of problems the Sheik had outside of the ring. Would you say that Captain Ed George or Ed Farhat Jr., was he a problem or was he just a wacky son? Or was he part of the problems that started developing? I think from a creative point of view, he definitely was part of it. Because if you if you talk to diehard Detroit wrestling fans, a lot of times you'll get the impression that it was like the jump the shark moment is when all of a sudden Captain Ed George is out there and he's being pushed. I mean, it says a lot that the one time, you know, that the Sheik was really making an effort to create a new top star, it was his own son. And, you know, he he was trying to make him into this, you know, blue collar kind of working class hero baby face. And it just wasn't working, you know, and and on top of that, he had also made him the booker, which also was a very unpopular decision with the wrestlers, where the impression I got from talking, to, especially some of the old timers, was that they just didn't have to listen to him, that he would come in and he would tell them and they would go, yeah, 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 that's what we're going to do. And then they would just do whatever they wanted. <laughs> so so things like that were also 
hurting the business. I hate to say, and, and and I feel bad in a way. I know that there's all these stories of promoter's sons and people like to talk about like George Goulas and people like that. And, and I, and I, and he's in that category, but I, I, I feel like he got put into that spot to a certain degree against his will. And it, he, he wasn't really pushing for it. He actually wanted to be a rock star. I mean, music was his thing and he was trying to get a record deal and, and he kind of got roped into the wrestling and he, it's very telling that he stopped doing it. He only did it for about three or four years. He stopped doing it. Not even when big time went out of business, but even right before that, when things were looking really bad, he just kind of ducked out and just got a regular job. I just don't think that his heart was in it to, to the same degree. And, and, and that's really what it came down to. He, he, he got put in this position. And I know RVD told me the story that uh, I guess he had heard it from from Sheik that when Eddie Jr. finally approached him and said, Dad, I don't I just don't think I want to do this. You know, is it would you mind if I if I stopped? And Sheik was like, well, wh why the fuck didn't you tell me this before? You, you, I, I'm not. <laughs> you, you didn't have to be a wrestler. You know, all you had to do was tell me that. Why would you make me do all this with you if you didn't want to be a wrestler? <laughs> Hey, at least uh, Captain Ed George had a longer and more successful career than Bruiser's son, Leroy Redbone. There's so many like that. I mean, he did yeah, at least. It's he every 70s promoter. Event. Every single, almost every, every single 70s, 70s yeah. promoter had a son in the late 70s or 80s who tried to break in. And some it worked and some were George Goulas. It makes you wonder why Vince Sr. never tried to force his son to get in the ring. He's the only oh, one who said no. He, right. he was yeah, the only one who well, said no. You can't do that. That's and and that's the thing. Vince really wanted to, but his father wouldn't let him, so he had to wait till he was sixty and <laughs> run the thing himself before he could break into business. Oh my God! But hey, um, Brian Brian Solomon Brian S. Uh, the title again of the book is Blood and Fire. Wait a minute. Hold on. I've got to find this. I've get, got the subtitle jotted down. Blood and Fire, the unbelievable real-life story of wrestling's original Sheik by Brian Solomon. And you can pre-order now on Amazon. Uh, the release date for the actual physical book is April the 12th. But the folks can hear more about it and a lot of other stuff because you've got a new podcast, Brian Solomon, on the Arcadian Vanguard Network, uh, administrated by Brian Last. All you Brians. <laughs> That's right. Shut up and wrestle. Brian Last, fill us in on all the details about where we can hear that podcast. Shut up and wrestle with Brian Solomon. Two episodes out already, and they've become very popular. You could check them out. If you want to avoid any of the big players, like let's say Apple, you can go directly to the website, suawpod.com, or of course, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find your favorite podcast, Spotify, it is there right now. And of course, episode one, Stu Sachs. Episode two just came out with the Blue Meanie. Many other great guests coming in the weeks ahead. But Brian Solomon, let me give you a moment to talk about your own show. Sure. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and I also want to thank you for giving me a platform to do it on because I was going to try and just kind of do it on my own and see what happened. So. I'm grateful to be a part of what you've got going on. But my idea was to do uh, an old school themed wrestling podcast where, you know, there's enough people out there that are talking about the current stuff and they don't need me adding to that. And I, I wanted to um, make it very conversational. You know, I started realizing that there's enough people that I know, even just casually, that I have some kind of relationship with that I can talk to and just have conversations with where it doesn't even really feel like an interview. It's more like just two friends talking about what they love about either the wrestling they grew up with or if you're a historian or a writer or whatever, the wrestling that you're of the past that you're interested in. So I built it around the idea of these conversations with interesting people in and around the business. So I've, I've got the next one is going to be with Keith Elliott Greenberg, who I've worked with for years and years in magazines. Um, I've got Jeff Walton on one coming up, Les Thatcher. And so I'm just trying to keep that theme of just these casual conversations about um, old school wrestling. And my definition of old school, by the way, if for people that wonder, is roughly if it's older than 20 years, it's fair game to talk about. 
I wanted to mention one thing about the book to uh, talk because uh, the physical copies do go on sale April 12th. People ask me this all the time. There is also going to be a digital edition, like a Kindle edition of the book. Um, and I know there's also going to be an audio book. And the reason I know is because I am actually going to have the chance to record it myself, which I requested that they allow me to do. So, you know, there's going to be all different ways to to consume the book, however you want to call it. Just don't I'll eat it. <laughs> I was about to say, the <laughs> sheik, if it's a necktie or a, an announcer's piece of paper, the sheik will eat it. All right. But anyway, Brian Solomon, thank you very much for, for being a, a guest on the program today. I love talking about the sheik because he's mystified me and captured my imagination since I saw him when I was a kid. And again, one of those people that you only come across in the professional wrestling business, just like you are, Brian, just like Brian last is just like I am. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Th this was a pleasure. I I'm, I'm so glad I got a chance to talk about this stuff with you. Well, that was a great chance to talk to Brian Solomon. And, and again, from the time that I first started watching wrestling, when I was a kid, either in, as I mentioned, Aunt Lola's in Cincinnati for the Sheik show, or then later on when he and Bruiser made up and I got to see him on Bruiser's TV a couple of times he came down to the gardens. I was fascinated by the guy and you can understand why he drew the money that he drew when he was allowed to do things that nobody else could do because he was the best one at him. Nobody created that aura and that, that persona of, craziness and violence and mayhem and whatever as well as he did so they let him be the one to do it and nobody else was allowed to because then it would just be as we mentioned chaos and it wouldn't get over but one guy doing that shit on a mainstream basis in the biggest markets in the country for years it worked anyway we won't do that anymore because they anytime somebody comes up with something now that three people emit a loud fart over by next week. Everybody's doing it. Yeah. If the Sheik existed now, every indie would have multiple matches with guys with pencils running around. Yeah. And, and it would just be just a mess. But anyway, I just, I feel bad the way that finally the Sheik's body broke down at the end and, you know, he just couldn't emit that aura anymore. And I'm just wondering if, Again, back in those days, Brian, the days of the Sheik when he was first formulating himself, if they just had echelon fitness equipment around, he would have stayed in better shape for so much longer, don't you think? I think so, and considering how many rooms he had, he could have had multiple home gyms with echelon equipment. Oh, yeah, in, in one room he could have had the, the sleek fitness screen, in another room he could have had the smart rower. In another room, the stationary bike, and I could have put the auto-folding treadmill out in the backyard so that the whole neighborhood could watch it fold up by itself. <laughs> I guess so, Folks, yes. If you haven't been working out enough, if you don't want to go to the gym and be around other people sweating and breathing on you, if you want to get sha in shape but you don't have time to get to the gym, Echelon Fitness brings the gym home to you. Whether it's a New Year's resolution or just a commitment to stay in shape, it can help when you have the world-class instructors like Nicole Griffin and Michael Brown. They're world-class and they're instructors and they're choreographing classes with music from your favorite artists like Tina Turner and whoever knows who else. That's my favorite artist. And you get a community of hundreds of thousands of people who can give you that extra push. My God, with hundreds of thousands of people pushing you, be like a Who concert in Cincinnati. Be careful. Ooh. But Echelon Fitness is the affordable way to get the workout equipment, the workout community, and an instructor's motivation because they provide you with thousands of live and on-demand classes. And I'll tell you what, if you take every single one of these classes, there's thousands of them. You'll sweat your balls off. You can work out anytime, day or night, and crush your fitness goals. Crush them. Snort them up and spit them out. As we've mentioned, you can pick your class and climb the leaderboard and cheer each other on. If somebody strikes you the wrong way, you can boo them and hope that they fail. 
It's all available with Echelon. That's not how it works. No, focus on your own personal fitness goals and not booing people. I don't even think you can boo people, but don't focus on that either. Well, you got to be focused. But the there are no heels in the world of fitness. Well, if you're barefoot, it's up to you. But the instructors are supportive, engaging, and fun. They really know how to get you moving. And if that doesn't work, then they'll start berating you endlessly until you finally perk up and get the lead out of your ass. There's around-the-clock classes for the family, including full-body workout programs, and I'm anxious to see what part of the body that they work out first. One membership will cover a family of five. I guess if you don't have five, then you can bring some neighbors in. Anyway, right now for a limited time only, my podcast listeners get up to $840 off the MSRP on some of these fine products. Get this exclusive discount. You got to text DRIVE, D-R-I-V-E, to 81881. Again, that's drive to 81881 to get up to $840 off the MSRP. Message and data rates may apply. Terms available at echelonfit.com slash SMS. Membership sold separately. Yeah, I don't know. You think the Sheik would have gotten a membership? I don't I think he probably would have stolen one some way. And then if anybody came and tried to take the equipment away, he would have cut them with a razor blade. Or said someone stole the box office. Someone, someone stole the auto-folding treadmill, Captain <laughs> Ed. 